The next couple of verses contain nothing new. I don't suppose there's anything unusual about that. What it means is it's an opportunity to take stock, look at things afresh. And we're actually approaching the final run of verses and things seem to go off the rails quite a bit. And I think it's quite important to make sure that we haven't gone off the rails as well. It's always a possibility. I was having a look at a blog recently about some of the problems with mindfulness. Mindfulness is a Buddhist technique which has been incorporated into a lot of Western therapies, cognitive behaviour therapies. But the thing about mindfulness is it can unlock quite a lot of very deep stuff. The mind can react and throw up huge amount of difficult material. And mindfulness is really at the heart of enlightenment practice. When we start looking into this awareness of our moods, of our sensibilities, when we actually start breaking out of the habit energy, the pattern of our moods, of our sensibilities, then the mind can really throw up some very difficult stuff and I've referred to this on occasion during the course of these videos in fact video 196 was entitled The Dark Shadow of the Ego so although I hope in these videos that you get a sense of the underlying balance and equanimity that is being pointed to by these verses. In practice, it can be very challenging indeed. And I, I've used my own personal example to illustrate this during the course of these videos. But anyway, before I say any more about that, let's have a look at the verses. Verse 714. The ignorant addicted to dualism cherish dualities, atoms, original matter and primary cause, and fail to understand the means of emancipation because they adhere to the alternatives of being and non-being. And I think I'll just read the next verse as well. 715 as the ignorant grasp the fingertip and not the moon. So those who cling to the letter know not my truth. So this verse should have quite a lot of familiar material. Being addicted to dualism. This is a discrimination of a me here experiencing a world out there. This is the fundamental dualism. And we seek understanding. We, all, we actually all do have some kind of understanding of who we are and the world out there and our relationship with it. This colours who we are and how we are. So it's very important to have some understanding. And the understanding that's being presented here is one of science and religion. Both science and religion assume this basic philosophy, this basic dualism of a, an individual here experiencing a world out there. This is what we get caught up in even when we're looking into things a little more deeply. We might look into religion, we might look into mysticism, we might look into spirituality, 
we might look into science and, and put our faith in science. Somebody replied to a review that I wrote a while back of a book which was inspired by the Sagaticum in these very verses of the Lankavatara Sutra and uh, obviously a very intelligent fellow. My impression is he's very much into mathematics and how mathematics validates the truth of what's being presented here in the Sagaticum. And this is all very fine and fascinating. But it's a bit of a distraction, really. The truth that's being validated is the insubstantiality of the external world. And this is all in the context of the primacy of consciousness. And the Sagatakam assumes the primacy of consciousness. Indian spirituality assumes this. But what is often missed is the implication of this for our relationship with the world. And the implication is that the world has no substance, no intrinsic substance. And therefore, we should not take our cue from it. We should not allow it to fuel our moods and our sensibilities. Our moods and, sens our moods and sensibilities are what keep consciousness in bondage, in limitation. So, this mathematical approach is all very well, but it's still very much caught up in the world of dualities, atoms, original matter and primary cause, and not really getting on with the means of emancipation. I've often described mathematics and science as like a model very excellent model of reality but not of reality itself. Now, it might be that mathematics is a little bit special in that the model actually does point beyond itself. It's like a map which is saying put the map down and take a look around. You don't really get any maps like that. I suppose some maps do that. They might mark something which says point of interest in which case you're being encouraged to put the map down and take a look so maybe I shouldn't be too harsh on mathematics but we need to be careful that that's not taking up all our energy we need to get on with the means to emancipation and that is looking at the implications of all this in our moment to moment being So this is also the, the message of verse 715. Not to grasp, not to grasp the fingertip and fail to see the moon. We can get so caught up in teachings. If you've ever tried showing a dog where you're pointing to, and the, and the, ball, the dog's ball's lost and you see where the ball is and you're pointing to it, but the dog's just looking at your finger. And this is how we are. Our basic nature is still kicking in, no matter how sophisticated our understanding. This is where the mindfulness comes in. We really, really have to look at what's going on right here, right now, in terms of the patterns of our limiting psychology. So the reason given in verse 714 for failing to understand the means of emancipation is because in our ignorance we adhere to the alternatives of being and non-being. And this is something which often comes up, and this sounds quite philosophical. But we've been told in the past that being and non-being characterises this basic dynamic 
that consciousness is trapped in, that consciousness is limited by this basic dynamic. In other words, our psychology is characterized by being and non-being. And it's best not to avoid these terms. What being and non-being means, what this expression being and non-being implies is that we should look for ourselves rather than look to some dusty explanation about what being and non-being means. You can find lots of explanations for this if you do a search on being and non-being in Buddhism. It might give you some clues, but really we have to look at how being and non-being characterizes our behavior. And it's something which I've addressed over the course of these videos. Being and non-being actually has its own video, video 333. But I have addressed what being and non-being means. And hopefully I've been completely inconsistent. Because we need to look at this afresh each time. What does being and non-being mean? Well, it's very much to do with our relationship with the world. How do these terms fit in? Well, perhaps you can tell me or find some way of understanding how these terms fit in. Being is what I am and non-being is what I'm not. Or every time you look in the mirror, you're concerned with being and not being. You're concerned with trying to make yourself look a certain way, perhaps in a way which reflects your true inner goodness, your true inner beauty. I think if you're a woman then this might be a greater issue for you. But what other people see is often something completely different. So every time you look in a mirror you're, you're getting caught up in being and non-being. You're feeding the notion of what you are and what you're not. And who we are and who we're not is very much dependent on our connection, our dynamic with other people, both with people we know and people we don't know. This is very much what the world is for us. The world is people, society, culture, culture we live in. So this is a huge thing. And I mentioned the difficulties that proper spiritual practice can throw up. If you truly are working with your sensibilities, with your moods on this very deep level, almost like a forensic level, then things will change. You will change. Things will change at a very fundamental level in you. And this has very vital implications. I've been going through quite a lot of personal changes. And my health seems to be taking a turn for the better throughout the course of much of these videos. I've been going through quite a difficult time physically and this has affected my moods, uh, my emotions. My own suspicion was that this was something that was working its way through my system, something karmic even. And I've had lots of hospital and medical tests and I don't believe they've actually found anything. There seems to be various suppositions, various theories. But it's getting better. The indications in my latest blood test show a reversal of the trends that have been causing my doctor concern. And in terms of my practice, I feel like I've come out into this wonderful clearing and everything's very beautiful. And it's disconcerting. 
because I, I, I feel like I haven't got anything to work with now and that I've lost the momentum to practice and, I've, and at times I even forget what it means to practice it's taken me a few days to get around to this video because I haven't been able to relate too well to these verses I've lost touch because I, I've, there's a feeling that I'm not who I was and if I'm not who I was what is my relation to spiritual practice maybe I don't want to practice anymore doesn't mean anything these videos are a bit boring you know so it's a bit it's a bit disconcerting a bit discombobulating and I look ahead to some of the verses that are coming up and it's like somebody's come in and spoiled the party I'm not sure we'll see when we get to them but as I said it looks like it really goes off the rail it looks like the Sakatakam really goes off the rail towards the end so I'm thinking maybe it's time just to forget it forget these videos the thing about spiritual practice is it's not life. In a way, these videos are the most important things I've done. They're what I'm about. But fundamentally, they're not life. Life is something you get on with. You need to be doing things. Life is where you put these teachings into practice. They're not something in themselves. This is quite an important point. Spirituality isn't about cloistering yourself away somewhere and just getting on with practices. By all means, you can do that sort of thing and maybe it's useful for a while or necessary for a while. The proper spiritual practice or enlightenment practice is set in the arena of everyday life and everyday life is about getting on with things so this is my challenge what am I getting on with as much as these videos are very much my mission and what I feel I should be doing they're not life they are not life so this is important if you're following these videos and you're connecting with them and they're relevant to you that's wonderful but at the end of the video you need to get on with things and hopefully bear whatever insight has opened up to you, you bear that in mind and deepen it through the practice of the day. So this is the means of emancipation. We apply the teachings. We don't get caught up in the fingertip. We don't adhere to the alternatives of being and non-being, which is all about defining the ego. We're not interested in the ego. So as I said, these verses, there's nothing new, but our situation is always new. We continually come back to it and examine it afresh. <laughs>